Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the rationalinvestor.com's uh, broiler chicken show. Buck, 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 buck. Um, I'm not very good at these intros. I suppose that's something Chris and I need to work on. But uh, we have been um, sort of mulling over how can we uh, better serve the, uh, the broader public. And I sure would love to try and get these views up. I think the message that we give is correct. I uh, don't really hear too many people on the uh, public talking about process goals and working with a trading plan, having appropriate risk management, um, and just acting responsibly um, in the marketplace. Um, as you can see on the background behind me. Uh, so one thing that I was uh, sort of told recently was, uh, you know, we, you know, maybe to try and uh, make a better connection with the YouTube audience, uh, maybe try and have yourself on camera. So uh, Chris, uh, of course, is uh, really uh, very good at uh, this uh, YouTube stuff. And uh, he does this with Julian. So uh, we'll give it a go uh, for like these Sunday shows, uh, these uh, public broadcasts. Um, and I, you know, just FYI, if you're watching and you're kind of like, why is he always looking over there? I have like all of the, the YouTube page and all the different chat rooms and stuff on this screen over here when I look over there. <laughs> so that's why if I'm looking to see like Alex V says, what's up, Brian? Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, Joshua says, waka waka. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Um, so if I'm looking over in that direction, I think the camera's right there. I've got uh, the dashboard. Hopefully you can see the TRI dashboard right in front of me here. It is sort of, and we've got the camera. And uh, Chris has set me up with a video ninja uh, thing. And of course, uh, there I am on camera. Uh, just slick back the hair. Don't really look too pretty. Uh, but I hope... Uh, uh, as I chat away here, uh, being on camera does make a difference. I don't know how it will. I've said pe to people repeatedly over my career, I don't really care what I look like. Just try and hear my words, try and hear the message. That's the most important thing. And really, ironically enough, if you really want to get good at trading and, and good at learning and taking the most value out of these videos, you should all have your... Uh, TRI notepad in front of you. Shameless plug. Let's see, where's the camera? Oh, the camera can't pick it up. Oh, darn. Anyway, there it is. You can see. Ha. Ah. Then you can get this in our swag shop, too. <laughs> anyway, terrible plug. But uh, you should all have your notepad in front of you, and you should be feverishly taking notes. And you don't even really care what Brian looks like. He could be sitting there smoking a cigar, wearing a diaper. As long as he's giving you half decent information, that's all that matters. And I have to say, um, you know, I don't really want to toot my own horn too much, but I, you know, frankly speaking, I'm actually surprised uh, that um, that after eight years of doing this, I don't hear more people in YouTube. And even, you know, they've got like YouTube short videos now about trading and stuff. And I just don't hear people talking about the process and trading setups and trading with a trading plan, taking appropriate risks, trying to figure out what type of investor you are. It's every single video on YouTube is all about me, 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 me. This is my approach. This is how I made a bunch of money trading my squiggly line theory. And I got to say, folks, if you don't understand that actually your behavior in the market is really all about you and the individual that you are and how you're going to set yourself up so that you as an individual succeed in the marketplace. If you can't get that, and frankly speaking, I don't know how you get it from any of these YouTube influencers. If you can't get that, there's no way you're going to succeed at this game. You're going to ride somebody else's coattails then somebody else is going to trip up and stumble, which always happens. Nobody's ever 100% right in this game. Um, you're going to lose a bunch of money blindly following uh, Luna. I mean, God, remember the lunatics? How are the lunatics doing right now? I got a feeling a few lunatics are in the loony bin now uh, if they haven't already committed suicide. 
uh, I mean, that's a terrible comment, but the point being that it's not about me. <laughs> I mean, I can come on camera and look at this. I got, look at that. I got the fancy swag. I got the notepad, right? And all of you should have your damn notepads. No problem. Taking lots of notes. Look at that cool uh, background image. This is cool because I could just go and point from uh, NFT. And there you go. Uh, where are they? Okay. So NFT image to NFT image to NFT image to NFT image. And what I was actually thinking about doing, and this is kind of fun. I don't know whether it'll happen or not. But I wouldn't mind auctioning off each of these uh, images. They were put together by uh, a site member who used to be on the site last cycle, a guy named Mo out of uh, LA. And I even asked him, uh, do you mind if we NFT these as a way to sort of help pay for uh, the TRI campus in Portugal that we're uh, trying to put together? And he's like, sure, yeah, sounds like a good idea. So uh, this is a bit of a bizarre way to start the video. Uh, I do. I, I mean, obviously, in this crazy inflationary world, uh, people's economics are changing. I mean, the irony of it all is I want to try and keep this as low cost, as free information as much as possible. So maybe the monetization of these uh, of these YouTube videos on the weekend. Um, and also uh, we do a crypto show on the on the week uh, on Wednesdays. Maybe this can be a way that we can uh, boost viewership, things like uh, Brian appearing on camera. Hopefully that, uh, that helps a little bit. Um, then that way we don't have to raise prices. Right? We just speak to a wider audience. School enrollment still remains fairly robust. And we don't really have to uh, you know, even charge money for these kind of free videos and stuff. And then by the way, you know, if you're here to learn how to trade, I would uh, strongly, strongly suggest that, you know, if you are relatively new to this and you don't want to spend a lot of money to get going, which is a terrible thing to, for a marketing guy to say, but uh, our, uh, our webpage, and I'm not even sure if I'm showing this on the, uh, on the video or not. Chris, uh, do they see the, uh, the YouTube page here? Is Chris still here? <laughs> I don't even know. All right, Chris says they do. Uh, pop on this uh, YouTube video. I mean, this this is an absolute gold mine. Absolute. I mean, I don't even know. Like uh, the uh, this is the show that you're watching right now, the uh, Broiler Chicken Show. How many episodes are in here? It must be hundreds. What does it say here? Is it given number two hundred and forty four, two hundred and forty four, and you can see an average of about two to three hours each episode. That's a hell of a lot of viewing, folks. <laughs> All for free. I mean, maybe what we should do is throw commercials in there. I don't know. Uh, and then we also have our crypto show on the weeks. But, you know, the number one question that I have, and you can see, uh, I can understand the school term is out right now. So our viewership's probably a bit light. And it is the middle of the summer. So but you can see, you know, we average a good 1,000 or so views per video, which is excellent. That's great. But how do we get the message out to the public? Because as I've said repeatedly, uh, I think that TRI is ready for prime time. Uh, the old man, I think, uh, I think he knows his, his stuff. I think he knows how to trade. And more importantly, um, he knows how to teach all you guys um, how to set yourself up for success. I mean, like I said before, I don't see anybody on the internet doing this. You would think that this channel would be insanely popular. Because this crazy Canuck will just sit here and walk you. You through. don't. You don't want to hear none of this, right? Well, you don't what's want to hear none of this. Isn't that interesting? So I can hear somebody talking. Chris, you don't have any idea what's going on? That was bizarre. They've been muted. Okay. Maybe if somebody was, oh, <laughs> they're probably sitting here in the, in the uh, video going, uh, you know, are you going to talk about the market, say, stupid old man? <laughs> anyway, um, I guess the point being, if you, if you are in the Hangout and you want to, hey, there, is that you? Um, Somebody saying, Franklin, please mute your mic. <laughs> right. So as you can tell, uh, teach an old dog new tricks. I, I'm willing. I really, I mean, I've all you people in uh, YouTube land know my crazy story with Liam. 
So I am highly, highly motivated. I don't want to shill you people. I mean, if you want to come into the school program to learn how to do this, I think it's excellent value. Uh, and if anything, what we should do, and uh, maybe somebody can, uh, can make a note of this, is uh, we should have a, a, um, a raffle for this upcoming school term. So Chris, maybe, can you, uh, can you maybe make a note of that? Um, if you're interested in participating in the raffle for this upcoming school term, um, we're having a meetup in Portugal in the middle of September, and I think we'll probably do the raffle the weekend of that meetup. Uh, we should all be pissed drunk that Saturday. I think it's the 17th we're officially doing the meetup. Uh, right here, 16, 17, 18. And I'll, I'll make a, a serious attempt to try and do a broiler chicken show, but we might all still be drunk. So it should be fun. But at the very least, everybody that's in the public, um, we should do the raffle draw that Sunday. And then I think what we should probably plan on is uh, maybe maybe we start the, uh, the fall term a week or two late. I don't know. Because normally we like to start the fall term sort of like the week following the Labor Day weekend. There's the Labor Day weekend. It's the 5th. I guess that's a bit late this year, but nonetheless, we would normally, I guess, start the fall term probably like the 12th, but since we're having the Portugal meetup right through here, maybe we'll start the school term like the week following, something like that. So, uh, Chris, if you could maybe just put a note in our little document, plan to have the raffle on the Sunday the 18th, the actual drawing. And, um, and let's maybe, you know, what, where are we now? We're the 14th, so we've got one, two, three, three weeks of broiler chicken still before uh, I leave. And then uh, we'll do, I guess, a broiler chicken show on the road on the 11th. I think actually we'll be in Porto, uh, Portugal there. Maybe show you a few pictures of some of the places we're looking at up in Northern Portugal. And then um, uh, we'll do the, uh, the, uh, the big draw, the, that 18. So, hey, there, there's, a, uh, there's a vacation, eh? Brian's on vacation. He's still going to do your uh, broiler chicken show for you. <laughs> now that's dedication, man. <laughs> so, um, you know, we used to have like a wheel and we used to have a big email sign-up page. So... Uh, if anything, uh, let, we'll try and get all that stuff going in the next week or two. And then that way, hey, maybe you get this school program for free. I mean, what the hell, eh? Uh, positive karma. So um, that's, um, uh, that's the, I think, our plan here going forward uh, for this fall term. But I guess, you know, that I mean, just getting back to the, just the general message. I mean, frankly speaking, I think our education program for the price that we charge is very, very good. People come out the back end of it with a very, very robust education. And I mean, it's not free. So uh, I'm not going to say this is, uh, this is uh, a walk in the park. I mean, you are going to spend some money and, you know, you are going to work. It's a full year long program. Um, and uh, I do believe, in fact, actually, the, uh, the co-host uh, for the Wednesday shows, uh, Paul, uh, he, he's basically taking the level one program, and uh, he's very, very disciplined in, in his approach, and he's just simply trading the level one concepts uh, in crypto, having a lot of fun with that. So watch on Wednesdays uh, what a typical sort of trader coming out of TRI looks like. So uh, I guess um, bottom line here is uh, highly motivated to try and um, improve this YouTube viewership. So I am, you know, trying to do things. I'm on camera here. Somebody gave me some feedback recently that I really should be on camera. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, uh, you know. Uh, Anyway, I'm on camera. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> um, and we're trying to do this uh, call through Zoom so that, uh, that you know, maybe you have a little bit better picture quality. Maybe that helps. 
And if you, you know, if you want some feedback, you know, as always hit the like button, subscribe, ring Colleen's bell, all that kind of fun stuff uh, for the notifications that makes YouTube happy. Um, if you have suggestions, feedback, please uh, leave them in the comments and we'll see if we can continue to make this a better product for everybody. And if anything, I want you all to think, don't really think about this as TRI, think about this as Liam, right? Uh, Brian is going to an uncomfortable place here to try and boost the viewership, to try and monetize the channel, all that crap, because we got to get Liam out of this stupid state uh, healthcare system. And uh, that ain't cheap. <laughs> so just being honest with you people. I mean, uh, um, I'm not the best sort of, you know, salesman when it comes to that, because I'll just tell you the truth. You know, I'm in it because um, I want to change my son's life, which means I got to make some money. And I would prefer not to charge you if we can go this monetization route, blah, 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 blah. Okay, enough of that bullshit. Let's get on with the market. Um, purpose of these Sunday calls is really to speak to questions that current students might have about the um, um, on the mark uh, on the uh, education material that maybe either instructors or TAs might not be able to speak to. Also, to you know, I it uh, I don't really want to go into depth. Um, uh, in, in these free videos about how the uh, platform works and the signaling. I will say unequivocally, uh, very, very dangerous market, which is very scary. Now you can see the country funds have gone 90% bullish on short and medium term. You can see the S&P 500, here we are right up at the very top. And frankly speaking, uh, there's not a hell of a lot of more good news that we could actually see uh, come into the market. Um, in a weird sort of way, some of this sort of good news about GDP and stuff has actually been spurred by the fact that the oil industry has done very, very well over the past quarter. So we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place now because now uh, comparisons year over year, quarter over quarter, they're not going to be nearly as friendly. So, you know, everybody's rah, 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 higher stock market. But like here in Canada, for example, half of the rally in the stock market is just basically because the oil industry is moving higher. And now, and it, I can also understand it to a certain degree that the energy market uh, caught a bit of a break with Mr. Biden's legislation, uh, because uh, now actually a lot of these sort of, uh, you know, and we've been talking about this happening, things like carbon credits. Uh, if anything, now it almost feels like it should be carbon tax credits. But now even things like the coal industry <laughs> is actually going to be able to stay in business which I do find quite amusing. And I put a funny tweet out about that at the end of last week. But now, you know, we went through this period where at the end of June, everything was on its knees and everything looked horrible. Well, you can see we've rallied up smartly and now everything is very, very uppy and toppy. Looking a little dangerous, if you ask me. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, spent lots of time over the past, probably a month or so talking a little about, you know, political cycles and actually probably, I guess the last six months. I don't know whether I really want to go into too much depth about that today. Uh, but if we just quickly take a boo, I'm worried that, uh, you know, they, I guess two things. First off, DC annual cycle, what typically happens in uh, years that ends in twos. Interesting, uh, the site's uh, trying to say hello. Um, this was the original port report that was put out by Larry Williams back um, beginning of the year. Uh, and you can see there's a bit of a bump up mid-year and then we kind of am out and then we had to crap out. And keep in mind, this is a proxy on the US market. What happens in overseas markets, oh boy, uh, I think it could be really, really big trouble. 
Then also, too, we have the typical uh, political uh, cycle price action. And unfortunately, uh, this particular cycle, I don't know whether uh, it has it on here. So beautiful uh, write-ups Josh does for the site here. Really, really good. Um, this was an update of the, uh, and keep in mind, this is all free. I mean, it's ridiculous. So if anything, um, he and I talked a little bit about how maybe we're giving too much information away for free here. <laughs> but anyway, take advantage of it while it's here, folks. This is just, this is absolute gold. Here's another uh, sort of uh, example of that DC annual and, you know, what do years ending in twos look like? So there was that summer trough. Usually there's a fairly substantial rally in the month of August. Uh, you know, are we here right now? Maybe. One thing that does bother me a little bit. Whoops, hello. All right, so Chris, I guess you have to be pretty quick on the trigger to make sure people are muted, eh? <laughs> so you got an extra job. I can't even see who's in the call or not. Uh, they should enter muted. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, the point being that, uh, this would be a typical two, if it weren't for the fact that we have, a um, you know, um, a, a political event down in the United States. Now they did just pass a huge, uh, sort of spending package, which I think to a certain degree was being anticipated. And I think you could make an argument that a big reason why a lot of this rally has happened over the past couple of weeks is in, in, in anticipation of that event happening, i.e. buy the rumor, sell the news. And to a certain degree, I think that also uh, is playing out in crypto as well. I think they see a high, high correlation with crypto and things like the NASDAQ and a lot of like crypto related stocks. Um, they're starting to make a heavier and heavier sort of impact on uh, on the tech sector, especially the things like the semiconductor sector. So um, my hunch is that the crypto chart is going to look a hell of a lot like this uh, before we're done the end of the year. And I suppose that's a good thing. You know, I was actually putting tweets out earlier. Um, I... You know, there, there will always, well, how do you say this? It's, it's so important for everybody to understand what type of investor they are. And again, you know, I started off the broadcast going down this road. Nobody on YouTube, social influencers or whatever the hell you want to call them, even, you know, frankly speaking, uh, the Wall Street crowds, you know, CNBC and all that, uh, you know, they, they'll use the, the, the sort of the textbook, oh, what, what, what's your risk tolerance, you know, that, that kind of talk and stuff. Um, but nobody really spends a lot of time in the, in the public trying to talk to the public about how important it is for the public, and that's all of you. There's probably only about 15 of you watching. And that's another thing about this, Chris. I haven't got a clue how many people are actually in the Hangout with us or how many people are on the YouTube page. I don't see any of that information now. So I, haven't, I don't really have no idea who's actually watching this or not. Anyway, nobody spends any time really get, saying, you know, before you go and spend money and before you take a trade, you know, try and figure out what it is you're trying to get out of all of this. And a lot of people that are like, you know, I just want to buy some stock for my retirement account or whatever. Oh, thank you, Matador. <laughs> uh, they get euchred into looking at a chart. Well, actually, this one isn't so bad, but especially something like this, you know, like this kind of trade setup. This is not for little old ladies. This really isn't even for Joe Sixpack. This is like high octane margin leverage trader dude uh, who's trading setups, right? Which I think a lot of you aspire to be. Um, and especially, you know, like uh, Monday to Friday, um, I'm in there. Uh, where the hell is it? I guess it's this page. You know, Monday to Friday, uh, you know, here, gold, for example. 
actually even the the Bitcoin chart, same sort of thing. But I'm, you know, I'm uh, in there like uh, day trading futures contracts, bullish bot setups, and uh, A B C D objectives, and coming into horizontal support and resistance. And you know, do I actually start getting bearish divergences and momentum indicators off of things like four hour charts? And of course, if I get all of that all set up, then I'm drilling down to things like the one minute chart and hunting uh, bullish bots and uh, El Tangonators and the whole light, right? Uh, basically, that's all this kind of stuff. Probably not best example. Of course, when you want to try and show people on YouTube, spur of the moment, you can never show them. Oh, here we go. So because this is the last time I was looking at the gold market in earnest. So something along those lines, right? Uh, hunting, hunting, hunting. Looks like this was a failed idea. Uh, I don't actually really trade gold that much. You know, the market, uh, and I used to be a prop trader when crude oil, but man, we used to trade lots of crude oil. So uh, there's an interesting setup. Looks like, uh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, we got up to, may have stopped to trailing and then she fell apart. But uh, point being that, if I'm a day trader and I'm trading futures contracts, believe it or not, I'm actually looking at this kind of time frame for flipping. And actually, I think I was doing this earlier. Um, yeah, like I said, <laughs> whenever you want to try and show somebody just to trade just on the fly, it almost never works. Uh, anyway, there's a great reload zone. I mean, look at that beautiful setup down there. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. Um, so, you know, if you are relatively new to trading and you're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of trader am I, what kind of market participant am I, take some time and really think this out. Um, you know, our education program, of course, you know, terrible show for it, but you know, there's a little setup I was hunting. Um, it helps you sort of identify who you are uh and when do you want to participate in markets and this is probably a really good example where something like this right you know lower time frames trading setups two to one now there's other people that are like you know brian i you know i just want to buy some for my registered plan and i just want to sit and just you know little old lady nanny nibble you know uh, any regular viewers you know how the lingo goes um and so I'm not going to get too wrapped up in these like four hour charts and technical indicators and stuff like that. Just tell me where's a good level to participate and I'll start nibbling away. That's that reload zone concept. So I will say that, um, you know, if we're looking at some, and probably this Ethereum trade is probably a really good example. Can you actually make the argument that this Ethereum trade right now is cheap? And I would say no. You know, uh, we're lucky, came in, uh, bought about 10 Gs, and it's pretty lucky. This is a spot trade. Further, this thing down, uh, basically at the big fat round number, we've enjoyed a very, very nice rally. And you can see how close I am to selling halves on doubles and stuff like that. But would I recommend somebody in the public to come in and actually buy that there? Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, the problem here is we're probably now actually starting to see things like bearish momentum divergences, which unfortunately, oh yeah, there it is. Bang, right in your face. This actually is the hallmark of a weak market, right? This kind of, this market actually could very easily take some time and clean itself up. This is, you know, this one tool right here, this is a daily price chart, this one tool you can see how the market went from extremely oversold and then very quickly, boom, 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 now we are officially overbought. I mean, see how quickly it can go from, hey, I'm pretty cheap, I'm pretty washed out to, actually now I'm pretty expensive and it's a little dangerous coming in and buying me here. Now that's this, if anything, this image right here, especially with that MACD bear div there, this image right here is exactly, um, how am I gonna do this? Not that one? This image right here, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, we had a really, really interesting um, uh, sell signal in the stock market back last winter when the uh, country funds both went overbought 
and the whole damn market just puked out. Uh, and it was like a two or three month long puke out. So this is very concerning, folks. Very concerning. I think we had sort of said before, and I think this is probably a good analogy. We had a bear cross on the S&P 500 breadth in overbought condition, but the teal was still sloping up. So in essence, that was a weak sell signal. And I think the stock market has bounced appreciably here over the past few days. If this actually now ends out and starts rolling over with teal actually sloping down now, that actually becomes a pretty powerful signal. So only time will to hell, but I'll tell you, you know, things are looking pretty uppy. Um, and maybe even toppy. If we go and look at things like, you know, just the SPY themselves, boom, there's your spiders. I mean, there's uh, the end. Well, I guess there's the end of July right here coming out of here. And if anything, you know, we talked about this at length a month or two ago. Here's where uh, Mr. Nancy came into the market, like right here. Uh, and you actually had, you actually had the better part of a month, really where you could have actually technically bought the stock market less than what Mr. Nancy bought it at. Uh, of course, I think he was buying individual issues, things like Apple. Uh, the 24th was when he had to report that he bought a bunch of Apple, so that was like right in there. Look at that beautiful outside upside reversal bar, wow. But you could have gotten yourself into Apple lower than his price. You'd be a pretty happy camper today. But what do you think? I think coming in on the buy side there makes a lot of sense now. And here's our reload zones. I don't know if you've ever heard Brian talk about this before, but usually I find this is where actually tops come into the market. So, uh, look at an image like that. Right up in this area would be a perfect place for uh, a nice juicy M, something like that. You can actually see, look at this M up here, pretty textbook. So can it, if, if you get that something that looks like that, are you ready, willing, and able to actually pull the trigger? And go short. I mean, wow, look at that. If you have the balls to short that, woo, -hoo! profit central. So, ironically enough, that's probably more realistic sort of trade setup that's developing. Now, actually, this might be an interesting trivia question. So, we'll jump right into can you get any value out of watching these pretty free videos? <laughs> How does the uh, trade process go? Let's start off with how about uh, at the bare minimum, um, how many reasons should you have to justify acting in the marketplace? <laughs> Hell, hey, boom, 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 boom. guys in the uh, in the in the uh, oh, even fancy, he got it down to initials now. Jeez, you can rip that up like that. Excellent. <laughs> Let's see if the YouTube, and actually it's interesting. We always like to check the latency. So let's see how we do. I'm going to wave and let's see how far behind YouTube is. So there's the wave. One steamboat, two steamboat, three steamboat, four steamboat. Did it, did it happen? Maybe it happened already. Oh, there it is. Do you see that, Chris? So it looks like we're about uh, three seconds behind now. Was that? Let's try that again. There's the wave. <laughs> One steamboat, two steamboat, three steamboat, four steamboat, five steamboat. Sit. Oh, there we are. So interesting, Chris. Do you notice that? That's a, that's a good. Uh, it's it seems to be getting longer. Maybe that's uh, Big Brother. Uh, <laughs> Chris, you got twenty three steamboats. Oh boy, that's not good. Oh, two to three. Okay, <laughs> twenty three steamboats. That'd be bad. I mean, you know what it is? It must be over on the West Coast because that's on the West Coast. Joshua, there's that five steamboats. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's get back to our question here. So 
YouTubers, you had plenty of time to answer the question. How many reasons should you have to justify taking a trade? Mississippi's or how many Mississippis do you have to have to justify taking a trade? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at least, and, you know, if you don't know this, for Pete's sake, people, please write this down. Please. You know, this is the basis of our education program, really. Um, now, here's an interesting trivia question for you. Let's say I'm a gap trader. I think we said somewhere, some guy found out that it turns out that there's a pretty high probability that gaps actually in on price charts. So now can you start to see, and of course you've heard Brian talk about his funny reload zone, 61.8 to 78.6. Can you now start to see how there's unrelated reasons to justify taking a trade up in this area. Hopefully you can start seeing that. Remember, I even mentioned earlier, you know, somebody came in and shorted that M, fail there. So if somebody shorted that before, is it likely that they're gonna come in and short again at that level? Well, they might. Fundamental situation doesn't change. Uh, notice that, hey, look at that, there was a gap up here before. So clearly, that gap idea, somebody actually respected that before. Look at how that M came in right at that gap level. So clearly there's a whole bunch of reasons. And actually look how there's an M top already from this original top. Actually that's valid from that level. So now you can actually, especially when you start drawing these kind of boxes and you know lines and stuff like that, we could also do things like crazy things like chaos theory to help us see sort of where the inertia of this bottom is gonna exhaust itself. Oh, hello. So we got 4669 all the way right up against these old highs. In fact, what I usually like to say is this is like a buggy line. So now you can start to see I mean, gee whiz, whether it be gaps, whether it be, in fact, you would probably even put this as original market structure top. Uh, where's, uh, double top, there, double top. So make that a different color. Uh, we also had this as an original double top up here. Uh, in our level two program, we call this tricking out your charts. But uh, what I would suggest to them is that they just put like lines like that and then call this uh, horizontal resistance. And we're gonna do one off of there. Hopefully you start seeing, oh my goodness, actually quite a few reasons to justify uh, this as trade location. Oops. Uh, now what have I done? <laughs> Brian. Okay, go like that. Uh, then let's see what else we wanna do. Now we can do another one off of here. <coughs> there we go. Anyway, you can start to see it starts to build up quite a bit, eh? So, you know, down here is a good idea to short. Probably not. Now that we're starting to rally up, uh, can you see a number of reasons to justify taking a trade? I think so. Um, my question for you, and this is where I was going with all this, maybe this helps you a little bit, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. What would we call, uh, or what category would all of these reasons that I just outlined, what category do you think that they would fall into? I think I had asked that earlier. Uh, um, we have uh, three steps. And really what I want is I want reasons in each of these steps. So you can call them steps, you can call them categories. I definitely think that there is a cadence because clearly you don't want things like indicator confirmation after price structure, that doesn't make any sense. So what sort of category, what section, what, what, what part of the conversation does all of this, what you see on the screen here, what does it fall under? 
Excellent. The Ballar Group. Ooh, there's a very powerful name. Good, Nick. Good, John. You know, they always say uh, the most important thing in real estate is three words, location, location, location. I hate to say it. I think it's the exact same thing um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, asset trading in the marketplace. Because the irony of it all, of course, is you could trade real estate in the marketplace. There's no reason why you can't pull up a price chart. So if you're going to do technical analysis, the absolute most important thing in all technical analysis is location. Like, you know, you see down here, you probably heard me talk about, and let's see, I will do a little trivia question. What is 1.618 called in mathematics land? One point six one eight. Very good. M Toshi's posting up a storm here in the uh, in the uh, chat room on the site here. Uh... <laughs> Somebody says here, since he's on camera, he doesn't swear as much anymore. <laughs> Uh, should I let one tear? <laughs> anyway, uh, 1.618 called the golden ratio. So as we, and you know, for our education program, we call this area down here between the golden ratio, at least I do, and it's my teaching. I don't think you're going to find anybody else in the in the entire world that trade teaches the crazy. You know, when I used to trade on the CME, they actually had a fucking dictionary of beamish isms that used to float around the floor because guys used to literally would walk around here going, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> That's a fact. It's an actual fact. <sighs> <laughs> anyway, Brian the weirdo. So uh, this this level from 1.618 down to 200% range extension, we call this, at least I call it, the parking uh, garage. Obviously, it doesn't make much sense uh, on the way down, but just think of it in simplest terms. Uh, Parking garages, every floor of the parking garage should be exactly the same. So there's a floor of the parking garage. There's a floor of the parking garage and there's a floor of the parking garage. So that 1.618 uh, range extension down to 200%, that's just another floor in the parking garage. Anyway, point being, uh, I can absolutely guarantee you without a shadow of a doubt, if we are coming into the, the parking garage and coming into 1.618, this is a horrible shorting trade location. You're going to get your head handed to you. And that's exactly what this is. <laughs> Anybody who's got short here at 1.618, you just ask him for trouble and you got absolutely obliterated. So trade location is critical here. Well, I might make the same argument. Anybody who's coming in on the buy side, anywhere around 78.6 up to 88.6, this is this is actually like what I would call shitcoin reload zone. Like the venture cap part of the market, it loves the 78 to 88.6 range to reverse. Most senior markets, they like to reverse in this uh, you know, 61.8 to 78.6 range. But, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised considering how speculative and frothy this market is that, you know, a rally into that window. Is that a good place to come in on the buy side with all of these justifications and reasons to be thinking about shorting? And maybe, you know, this is a location, so we're not quite at the stage to actually outright short, but... To think about buying here is just asking for trouble. It really is. So I might argue it's the same sort of image on the Bitcoin, right? Um, uh, 
Uh, let's see what we got here. You can see how we banged up against the foggy here. I still think we could work our way a bit higher. It's interesting too, uh, you know, I talked to you there a few minutes ago about horizontal support and resistance. That clearly is a huge uh, level, simply because a lot of people that would want to short. Uh, let's see, how can we do this? We'll do a double, double top just so you see it there. People who wanted to short, and really I might argue that there is the M top. If you're going to have a double top breakdown reference, and actually that's even a triple top uh, reference, but it's right up in that area there. Uh, but this is a valid market structure level, and especially if you're doing things like higher time frames, right? That's really going to show up there. Um, so, you know, if we zoom in um, on that level, where is that? Oh, gee whiz, that's basically just a little bit above where we are right now. So uh, this is an old sort of market structure failure level. My hunch is if we can actually get our way into there, a whole bunch of people that did want to sell on that breakdown will actually have their open orders to sell right there and they'll start hitting that. Does that, uh, can we work our way up to that other double top, the original double top fail level? Believe it or not, actually, I think we could. Uh, you see where the AB equals CD uh, level takes us. And what I wouldn't be surprised in this particular case, A, B, C, D, we actually do things like, uh, let's get rid of that. Whoops. Oh, dang. Uh, I noticed this uh, desktop platform. It's a little bit clunky. It really is. But notice, uh, remember we were making reference to that golden ratio number, that 1.618. This is what would be called an alt A, B, C, D, where you might actually have the... Uh, a to B, C to D leg, go all the way up to 1.618. That's very realistic. Um, and there's that original double top breakdown fail level. I, I like that. That's not out of the question. The trade right for the bot is to not expect that a, a, um, untypical move, but to expect the symmetrical typical move, the A, B equals C, D. So this particular setup would want to take profits at that 26, uh, 1, uh, 370 area. I do find it interesting that, you know, considering it is the friendly time of year for crypto, Bitcoin's having an awful hard time. Just even this is this is like, what, 10, 15 percent move. And Bitcoin's having a damn difficult time working its way up here. So clearly it shows that, you know, the sort of state of the market you know, anybody who was trading crypto in the past um, and, you know, uh, you know, we've been through these like two or three cycles. I even put, well, actually, I put a tweet out and in the in this sort of the, 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 the write up tag part of uh, the tweet, I even made reference to in years gone by, uh, this thing would double in a heartbeat. But now it's like moving like so, so slow. And then I actually erased that because I, that wasn't really the primary part of this message. But I will say that this is, this is very difficult sledding right now. And if anything, based on what I see here, this to me actually looks like a megaphone. So there to there. And there to there. So I wouldn't be surprised if we bang back and forth and probably even uh, come back against uh, this trend line here. Right? So that guy there, boom, boom, boom. Let's go back to my room. And then maybe one more boom there. That would make sense. Uh, and interesting too, you know, if we're talking chaos theory, really, what you see happening here in the marketplace is exactly what's supposed to happen. That's the irony of all of this. There is the original W. There's a bigger W here that produces that foggy up there. But I think this is the first real W that you see in price is right there. Before that, no Ws. Nothing ever confirmed here, no Ws. Finally, a W actually confirms and fires. And I mean, you tell me, 
this is where we get into that concept of confluence. <clears throat> I don't, you know, we, we'll draw the foggy, we'll throw on the levels. And, and really what we want to do is we just want to listen to the market. Is the market itself respecting that 2.618? Look what happened there. Right up, macaroni, get your ass out of there. Right up again, smacked off, not so big of a sell-off. Then up, then macaroni. I mean, clearly this is an important level for the market. And that in itself, just the fact that I can look at the price chart and I can look how price is obeying this level here, that validates that this is the bottom and the W that we should be concentrating on. That's what the market's concentrating on. So anyway, uh, interesting, right? So we uh, keep that higher, uh, this uh, 2.618 from the first bottom in the market. And I got to tell you, that's one hell of a pivot level for the corn here. So uh, if anything, this is a really good example, you know, a trader's life. I don't know what's going to happen here. This is why I like to trade trading plans. And I like to have setups all set up ahead of time. And I put a tweet out to this. And somebody even on Twitter said, Brian, can you slow down? And can you just talk to me like I'm a five-year-old? And frankly speaking, if somebody can't explain trading to you and can't explain, you know, this is where that stupid Luna got into so much trouble because nobody could understand what the fuck the guy was doing. And it turns out that there were holes everywhere and the whole damn thing blew up at the end of the day. And Seward even made a promise to himself. If I can't explain this stuff to my five-year-old daughter, I got no business buying this stuff. <laughs> and frankly speaking, I think that's a good idea. So... When it comes to trading, the absolute biggest thing that you have to worry about is yourself. And what I mean by that is that when we humans get anxious, we start to do erratic things. Our behavior starts to go crazy, right? We start to panic. You've all heard of the expression FOMO. Remember that guy, uh, uh, hey, technical indicators don't matter. Just you know, use my referral code and buy and you'll get rich. Boom, how did that go? Uh, and the funny thing is, is he's back out on fucking YouTube, uh, shilling like a son of a bitch. And somebody was even saying, God, it's almost embarrassing how he's just literally using every single one of Brian's little <laughs> phrases and catchphrases and not even slightest regard for <laughs> things like <laughs> oh, Da Vinci. That kills you, I swear. Oh, well, what can you do? Um, so. How are you supposed to logically walk yourself through this and really understand what the hell is going on and be able to take trades and go, yeah, actually, you know, I feel pretty comfortable with that idea. That it, this is the right trade. Uh, I've been trading, of course, this bot setup gets you to go long and uh, move your stop to scratch, move your stop to trailing, take profits for a very, very long time. So now it's to the point where if I see a bot, it's almost like, why am I not in the trade? Not, um, how do you say this? Uh, a lot of times people, uh, they'll buy something because of course somebody else says buy something, but they don't even really know whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, and the one, you know, as I sort of going on there a few minutes ago about the one absolutely great thing about learning things like reload zones, gap theory, horizontal support and resistance, market structure, you know, chaos levels, at least this gives you an idea of like, okay, I'm making a decision here, but is this decision based on sort of, you know, time-tested principles or is this just based on somebody you know just shilling hey buy use my referral code hey that guy's really popular awesome must be the right thing to do and i tell you i think that that in itself is a huge determinant as to your anxiety while you're in an investment decision i would also say too the 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 size of the bet relative to your portfolio 
is going to hugely influence the anxiety you experience in a trade. And of course, most new people come to trading and they want to go balls deep, right? That 100x leverage trader guy going to get rich, Lambos, the whole damn thing. And ironically enough, that's probably actually the last place. That should be the, the if you're going to take a trade based on those kind of like 100x leverage kind of thing, you want to have X amount of capital on that particular site, whether it be like Binance or, you know, in the past, if uh, they used to be BitMEX and, you know, uh, all the other different sort of leverage site trading uh, sites. And if all hell breaks loose on the trade, well, the worst thing that can happen is the capital that you have on the, uh, on the site is at risk. And, you know, just you see this set up so many times, you know, like, um, uh, well, I might even argue, you know, 1.618s, you know, you actually, uh, you see the market open up, head down, hit that 1.618, then the next day, beep, we open up, we start to reverse, and you're like, I've seen this so many times that I just got to get in there and I want to buy, you know, on that closing bar and I will literally risk to a break of the 1.68 level. And I, at this point, I'm going to strap on, say, that 10x leverage trade or 100x or whatever the hell. When, what's bothersome is that most people, like, start by opening up a 100x leverage account, throw money in it, and then go, okay, now what are we going to trade? And, you know, just randomly entering in a spot like right here. And you could get uh, market move violently up. Maybe you shorted this thing that was going to go down. Boom, you're gone. Or conversely, maybe you bought it. Boom, down, you're gone. The irony of it all is over like a two or three day period, the market doesn't really move anywhere, but they're just flushing out all the weak hands. Um, so, you know, how do you deal with that anxiety? The very first thing, of course, if you're relatively new to this game, the very first thing you do is just dial down the bet size. Just take smaller bets. You know, in this particular case, this was uh, supposed to be um, uh, the same size bet as the Ethereum trade. Basically, I bought, uh, I think it was a half a Bitcoin, right? At uh, 23,000, came out to about 12,000 bucks, an $11,500 trade. No leverage, just keep it really simple. If we lost these lows, I'd lose a couple hundred bucks. No, eh, no big deal. Uh, that's that's one easy way, and you can see it just ticking up and down. You also, you know, as a, an aspiring trader, you have to get comfortable having that position open there, and it just working away, and price going up and down, and this number oscillating all over the place. How do you do that? How do you be comfortable? You know, as uh, Johnny Hoagland would say. Uh, this is the only business where you are paid to be uncomfortable. So how on earth do you do that? But you got to know like time tested setups that, yeah, you know, statistically, if I come in on the buy side here and I risk against the three lows, and this is a really good example. Cause I remember I strapped the trade on right here on that mountain band inside bar reversal. And I went away. This is like a Tesla four hour chart went away for like eight hours and came back and I'm like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, I just swore. I wasn't looking very smart here, but I was like, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword, going to risk to a break of these lows. And as you can see here, two of the three lows, actually that should say of not or, two of the three lows got busted out here. And this is the number one reason why I have to have three lows is because this happens a lot. We would call these the noob stops. These are basically liquidity pools. I mean, you don't know what they're going to do. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the marketplace, folks. I'm sorry. You just don't. Um, and even in this particular case, uh, inside bar reversal, Harami, textbook definition, I would have thought that that would have gone, but nope, it needed one more Harami to happen. And it turns out that the next like level, actually what they really wanted to do was set up the trade off the 78.6, not the 61.8. Ah, well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> so how do you get to the point where you can come in and comfortably take this trade 
The answer is you've got to trade setups. You have to have all of this pre-mapped out so that, you know, quite literally the chart, and really I might even argue at that point right there, the hell is this nonsense? There we go. So at that point right there, oh, wow, look at all that. Um, that point right there, that's actually the point at which I go, you know what? Yeah, we might have a trade developing here. Now, you might look at that and go, Geez, you know, I just don't see it, Brian. And that's fine. I mean, if it takes a while to learn this, it's perfectly understandable. Uh, I also, too, in this particular case, this was a fun uh, setup. You can see one, two, three. It's breaking out. What's our rule? We want to wait for some sort of buy signal on the other side of the breakout. So you can actually see as it played itself out uh, how textbook this was, right? So there it's flirting with the level, there it breaks out. Do you chase that? It's probably not a good idea. Sure enough, down comes the market, right? And then, oh boy, okay, do we actually hold that trend line? Oh, we did. Oh, we went down a little bit lower. And you can see my, uh, my simple approach. How do I stop this? <laughs> stop. There we go. My simple approach is I want to let the trend line get broken. And then the first buy signal I get, this inside bar is a buy signal for me. Uh, first buy signal I get, I got to go. I, I just, I have to. And if I didn't take this trade, then it's sort of like, Brian, why? Number one, if I didn't take this trade, I'd be like, uh, you, sh you should all be like, well, why am I even listening to this guy? I mean, that that's so textbook Brian Bullish bot. Uh, but secondly, number two, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm in this to make a couple bucks. So, I mean, Jesus, <laughs> I've got to get in there and trade. So, and, and what was really interesting, like I said, through this, I was looking like a chump there. You know, I really was. You know, this thing was looking ugly. And then this is the way the markets almost always go. You know, at this point right here, this point right here. There would be, she's oh, not that shit again. Let me get out of there, right? There'd be a lot of people that'd be go, you know what? You're you're probably wrong. You should probably just walk away and, you know, don't uh, don't don't risk all the way to the break of these lows. Just you know, just take that small loss and get out of there. And that's what you have to actually train yourself not to do. So as I said there a few minutes ago, it's it's the business where uh, you are paid to be uncomfortable. And then you know, you never know how the hell it's going to happen. And you never know why. But usually, you know, there's an expression that always darkest before the dawn. Usually it's a, that exact moment something happens and it turns out the goddamn market pivots and heads screaming straight up. And there it is, right? I mean, it, it's weird. You can't write better fiction than reality. That was a really, really good example of how... You know, to, on balance, I would say most people were, you know, oh boy, we're, we're, we're toast. Just this rally just sprung up out of nowhere. Great example. Of don't get into the business of predicting the future because you just don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Trade your setups and live with them results. Uh, interesting, you know, I, if this is a megaphone, we have one tag, two tags, one tag, two tags. We should actually get a third tag here. And then that actually sets up a short for the uh, trade to come down and tag this megaphone line for a third time. And considering this uptrend line we talked about earlier, I like the idea that there it looks like there's some sort of date. In fact, why don't we, we'll just leave this on here and let's track through the week how closely my hunch is price is going to pivot somewhere around here. So we'll see what happens. And somebody was asking about Ethereum earlier. It's the same logic. There is the double bottom. In fact, this is a triple bottom. Probably a good idea if you're going to buy this triple bottom, risk against this low. You know, the noob stops or would be these. These would be liquidity pools. And believe it or not, I could easily notice this megaphone here. One tag, two tags. Now, we haven't hit this third line yet. So I would expect this level to be hit. And I sure fucking hope so. 
excuse my French, because <laughs> I've got a big fell sell half on a double order there. Less than 45 minutes. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's another thing uh, I have to mention, folks. I have to get a little bit more religious about these uh, Sunday shows uh, in that um, uh, I now have like oh, a better part of an hour commute to get to my son. Uh, the good old state's got him living basically on the other side of the city now. So, uh, 1230, no ifs, ands, or buts, damn thing's got to stop. So just be aware of that. Uh, I don't really have much wiggle room on that. And if there are questions, if you know future terms and stuff, we'll just uh, carry it over into the Monday show. So there's your Ethereum chart. And as I had sort of said, the irony of it all is that these lows, I think, are actually still very vulnerable. You could very easily, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you could very easily see something like that. And they clean out these lows and this low holds. I could see that. So it's fascinating how that megaphone line is basically right against there. Well, we could even see, and you know, this is the market, so the market will do any old damn thing at once. You could even see something like that, which would piss everybody off to no end. I don't, I don't expect that. And what probably is going to end up happening here is moving averages represent short-term support. You can see one, two, three. We've tagged this thing a few times. Maybe now it's time we come down and actually have a date with that 30 SMA because the market usually likes to tag that eventually. You can see how old the moving average cross is. Um, so you can't say this is a spring chicken. We're getting a little bit old now. Um, and if anything, I think what this really is, is I would like to see some sort of M come in here to actually say that this is a rounded top. As it stands right now, actually, I would still be just looking for higher highs and higher lows to work our way up into things like 38.2 of the whole range. I think you could also make the argument too that uh, this is one of these look left scenarios. So if you're looking at your price chart and you're kind of like, well, where the heck is price gonna go? Uh, again, all of this kind of stuff is to just try and understand, or um, what's the best way to describe this? try and alleviate the relative risk of uh, anxiety, excuse me, of, of having money working in the marketplace. So you can see that, um, oops, what do I want to be here? That's not what I wanted. We'll go uh, here. Um, well, let's do it simple, all right. Uh, so you want to understand that look left concept. You can just take the price action, boom, 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 boom and then just flip it around. So there is the rally low, right? Just in reverse. And I don't know, you could even stretch this out a bit. So can you kind of see how we're kind of just moving along almost like a pretty predictable path here, right? So you can see how we went uh, a dead cat bounce up, then we pulled back. You can even see there's the rally peak. There's the rally trough back to these lows. Now we disconnected a little bit here. Uh, just right away, we came straight down. Here it took a little longer to get going back up. But nonetheless, once we got through these levels, notice we kind of jumped straight up. So this is the direct high. I think that high corresponds with that high. But hopefully what you see is the market makes like in this case, on the way down, I was making lower highs and lower lows. And they look left, thinking the exact opposite. What you see is higher highs and higher lows. Just a mirrored image of this, but just going up now. Instead of going down, it's going up. So if you think about that, and I mean, look at the image, right? You can kind of see that this image, if we, uh, I don't know whether I can do this, but let's see what happens right there. You can kind of see that this looks like, um, sort of like a midpoint right about there. And we kind of go there to there. And we go something like that, there to there, right? See, boom, 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 boom. So that's what I would expect over here. I think this is probably something along the lines of, 
Bam, bam. Bam, bam. So I, I, I like the tags of these four, six, six, nines. I like the tag of 38.2. That's usually what happens. So we call this the first stop target. Also notice too, that there's a whole bunch of cluster of old lows. Remember I showed you, I think it was on the Bitcoin chart. The uh, previous lows were going to be um, basically resistance levels. So I like this movement up here. And the irony of it all is that from my perspective, uh, I don't know whether you see this or not, but this is just the way that I see it. I don't actually have this, uh, this top of this megaphone traded to yet. You can see there's, there's the rally peak. So this tells me that we could easily, you know, back up for a little bit and then get ready for another run, something like that. I even kind of see boom, 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 boom. Right? Is that sort of stair-stepping its way higher? I think so. And then, you know, the most important, you know, uh, from sort of a, we're looking at price action. So we're trying to, in real time, trying to sort of discern, this is what price uh, technical analysis is, is you're in real time trying to get a visual representation of supply and demand in the marketplace. And why is supply and demand uh, changing? The answer is because of uh, this big party that we're having this fall. No, no, no. <laughs> because of the merge, right? The merge, the merge, the merge of the word. Merge, 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 and merge of the word. Uh, I can't remember exactly what's the date. Did we put a date on when the merger is supposed to happen? But I would find it very hard to believe that we're going to break down ahead of that merger event. I find that very hard to believe. Once the merger event happens, then yeah, I think uh, we could be in a bit of trouble. Uh, September 15th, perfect. You notice uh, that's that first line there. So in fact, why don't we even put on here We'll put the merge, and maybe we'll put a big question mark kind of thing. So, oops, oh, it's way down there. Let's put it uh, center. Nope. Middle. There we go. All right. So, uh, if that's the case, I mean, maybe because it is that far away, we might very easily come down and just screw around like that for a while. Right. That could very, I mean, I don't know whether it's like that, but that could very easily be the case. Don't have any M's here. What I will say, though, is if we look at the indicators, like we said, we got a bunch of sort of warning signs that this wasn't a very happy market. The one good thing about this, as you can see, and this is probably because of the merge, is uh, you can see the buying interest is still very strong. So as long as the buyers are still stepping up when they need to buy, eh, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if anything, here's a good example that you say, well, Willie's stupidly overbought, so I'm going to short. What do you think? Is that a good idea? How many reasons should we have to justify taking a trade? Ironically enough, is this even in a good trade location here? And considering we are not um, at the megaphone level, we are uh, well above uh, the short, fast moving averages, but we're below the 200 SMA. 38.2 of the entire range is up here at 23, 2400. Fog and bombs are sitting up there at about 22, 2300. Is that a good short trade location? I don't think so. I really don't. Um, so just because Willie's stupid and, you know, interesting, Johnny Bollinger, he used to always say this, one of the, one of the, one of the strongest signs uh, a market is strong, if that makes any sense, <laughs> um, is a market that's overbought. So just because a market's overbought, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a sell signal. This, uh, this, uh, this is what actually what we call embedded. And it's actually the sign of a very strong market. And you can see RSI is still making higher highs and higher lows. I mean, it's definitely 
not cheap. I mean, it's good to see that it's not overbought. It's out of overbought at 68.58. But this thing could still make more Ws as we go along here. And of course, anybody who's followed my funny little W thesis theory, you can see M's came in here. So this big honk and W stopped the bear there to there to there. If you get another buy signal or another W here, it'd be a new buy signal. The only problem is, of course, is that uh, it's not through the 50 line. So it's going to be a weak buy signal. And if anything, that makes sense. I mean, does it not make sense? Look where we are relative to value. Should we be getting like rip roaring kick ass buy signals way up here? No, we'll probably get like sort of the end of the move, little buy signal that takes us up into the 200 period moving average, takes us up into Brian Selhoff on a double orders. There used to be people in crypto that used to hate when I would tweet out selling half on a double, banging out doubles, because they knew that it was all, you know, I was basically a pretty good example of the sort of institutional guys coming in and taking profits on the rallies off of the bottom. Ironically enough, actually, I wouldn't be surprised if the double level comes in off of the original double bottom level because of such a beautiful market structure. We happen to get in on the cheap here, but you know that's 1275. I wouldn't be surprised if the market rallies all the way up to 2500 to give these people that sell half on a double order. And that's not really that far away. That's just up into here. In fact, 50% of this entire range is um, that high right there. What is that? 2,800 bucks. And the funny thing is, is if you went out into the public and you pulled nine people out of 10 and you said, uh, do you think Ethereum's going to rally another $1,000 or another 50% higher than where we are right now? I'd be willing to bet dollars to donuts, nobody would say yes. That everybody would say, oh, I don't know. I think we probably got to go back down before we go up. So long and short of all this, hopefully what you see here is, is Brian doing anything with this trade right now? Am I tinkering with this trade? Um, am I injecting any sort of personal opinion? Oh my God, I think the market's going to roll over. No. Just letting setup just do its thing. I mean, setup told you to go long here. We happen to go long a little bit lower, so that's nice. My trading plan says that I have to sell half on a double anyway, get that risk-free trade because I'm a chicken ship by nature. It's just who I am. Ironically enough, if I didn't have that, then actually my order should be sitting right up here at the 38.2, and I won't do anything. Now, maybe what I'll probably do is let them have a little bit more when we do get up into this uh, Collins dump chaser zone here, uh, just because, you know, uh, once this rally is done and we have to get into the fall and we all know what the fall looks like, uh, go look at that political map of what the Democrats are going to do to this market into the election. So we all know that this market's going to come off into the fall. My question ultimately is where does this rally exhaust itself? And then that ultimately will actually define where it is that I can actually start to think about quote unquote reloading. And I guess that's the way I'm thinking about it here. I don't really like the idea of shorting crypto here. I think, and I think this, uh, this tweet here summarizes what I think nicely. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, rising. The market is an ass. No. <laughs> no, no. Actually, an old trader buddy of mine used to always say that. Here we are. So interestingly enough, if we actually take the, this is the 12 to 16 cycle and the 16 to 20 cycle, and now we've got the 20 to 24 cycle, which is about halfway done now. What do you think? Can you kind of see the similarities? It's pretty remarkable. Did I just swear again? <laughs> and interestingly enough, notice how all of these markets doink into that low, doink into that low, doink into this low. I got a funny feeling, people. We're, if you know, exactly where is the low? Do we have to come down and swim against this low a little bit more here? Maybe, but. Here's another interesting way to look at this. You know, first and foremost, 
This is supposed to be the crappy part of the market cycle anyway. Benner, George Bemmer, we talk lots about this on the site. Come, <laughs> come and uh, watch the Daily Briefs, and when we go on and on and on about this. Also, too, we know that the Fed is in the middle of a Fed raising cycle. And, you know, the old adage, don't fight the Fed. If you, if you don't know that, then you should be writing that down in your note journals. But don't fight the Fed. So really, we don't really need to get hurry on the buy side on anything until we actually hear out of uh, Chair Powell. Yes, we believe stimulus is in order. and We want to stimulate the economy. As long as they're talking about reining people in, uh, then uh, there's no hurry here. Notice how long this bottom took to develop uh, the first one, 16, 12 to 16, there to there. And then these are actually all happening uh, charts. So what at the beginning of the happening cycle to the end of the happening cycle, what do they look like? And frankly speaking, as far as I'm concerned, this is the only real fundamental event that happens in this space. Everything else is just fluff. Uh, but the actual happening event is a critical fundamental change to the story. And I think each cycle is completely unique based on, um, on the happening events. So if that's the case, and we can take yellow and blue and project them over the next cycle, well, it's probably gonna look something like this. And then, of course, you know, when this 2024 cycle is done, we can lay that over and get sort of a, a general guide as to when we should be thinking uppy and when we should be thinking downy. So interesting how Benner cycle almost aligns perfectly with the next happening event. Like, what the? F Hello? You think that's an accident? Do you think it's a coincidence? I don't know. Seems awfully suspicious to me. And then what a coincidence, the Fed is now saying that they're going to basically be tightening rates all the way through the first half of 2023. So we're going to get to the point where mid-23, the market's going to be exhausted of all these Fed rate increases. We're probably going to finally hear that the inflation bugaboo has been put to bed. Maybe China doesn't exist anymore. It dissolves into civil war. Maybe the Russia and all that crap finally fizzles out. I do believe that the Fed is going to bankrupt a hell of a lot of the third world. What a coincidence. You know, we've been basically told by the Fed to look for that cycle pivot in their short term interest rate policy. Also, too, there's a really cool chart that I put out a while ago that really talks about this. Uh, let's see if I can find it for you. And I'm talking way too much. You know what? I'm going to, uh, let's call this part one, right? And then we'll put in part two tomorrow. Uh, but there are other sort of anecdotes that are suggesting that the Fed, and I'll show these tomorrow, Chris, if you could remind me, uh, that the Fed should finish their rate cycle hikening, <laughs> if that is a term, uh, somewhere around the second half of 2023. So you can literally see the next bull market is starting. You can see it, like everything is coming into place. And of course, what do we always say? It's always darkest before the dawn. It's always crappiest in the, the middle of the bear. So ironically enough, if you can actually look at the glass as being, hey, everything's on sale now. What do we say about the stock market? We always say this is the only business in the world. When stuff goes on, goes on sale, nobody wants to buy. It's just, it's always how this damn game works. So ironically enough, if you are a Bitcoin aficionado, if you are a Bitcoin fan, now is actually when you should be most interested. Now, you don't have to go and time the market. I mean, you can wait for Ws if you want. Totally awesome. Or you can just sit and put yourself on a nice little dollar cost averaging plan. I think there's some idiot Da Vinci who calls it a little old lady plan that he basically stole from another person. So you could call it whatever you want. But the point of the matter here is you've got to force yourself to step up and buy when this shit is cheap. It's on sale. Anyway, blah, blah, blah.
I like the idea of little old lady, but I like the idea of little old lady as understanding who she is, what type of investor she is. She does not want to sell at a loss. She will not sell at a loss. She'll drive it, ride it into the ground before she sells at a loss. So you got to make damn sure if you're a little old lady, you're coming in at the bottom end of the market. And I don't think that Da Vinci guy ever learned that. So up here, he's telling people, oh, go and little old lady, buy here and you'll do fine. And you get absolutely destroyed. Stupid. Anyway, you can tell that that really bugs me the way that he doesn't even think about what he's saying. He's just such a doofus. Oh, well, now I'm going to get myself into trouble. Anyway. Point here is I don't mind the idea of us actually getting in on the long side. Now, another really cool sort of anecdote of Bitcoin here is the second image I put out with this, which is sort of what I was trying to get at is, do you notice that on a log scale, every time we do 50% retracement of the entire range that this Bitcoin thing likes to pivot? So here we are from the happening event to the peak. We are now 50% of that range. It's another anecdote that says that, you know, if you are here to make money from investing, now is actually the time when you really got to start paying attention. You can dollar cost average. You could wait for the W's and not buy for another probably six, eight months or so. That's fine. But now is when you need to start paying attention. And I sure hope this kind of video goes viral. And if it goes viral because of some feud with Da Vinci, fine. But the point is, now is when we want to be paying attention, not when guys are shilling dog money and on Saturday Night Live talking about how wonderful cryptocurrencies are. That's not when you want to be investing because that's walking into a trap. And ironically enough, is anybody talking about um, dog money now? If I understand correctly, I think dog money is starting to break out, isn't it? Hello, what do we got going on here? Where's Mr. Dog Money now? Is he talking? How ironic, eh? Look at dog, look at that, eh? Well, what a disaster. Does it make sense? Then you gotta come in. If you are serious about this game, here comes the W's. <laughs> Now's when you wanna be paying attention. How ironic, eh? <laughs> well, actually, you know, I, and, you know, very simply put, are we at or below reload zones? <laughs> this is a bottom right off of 88.6. So, I mean, that that's dog money, uh, you know, not dog money. That's, that's, that's venture cap investing 101. And how ironic. In fact, for our Wednesday show, we would call this uh, the Ben Kov check. <laughs> Thanks to that awesome rule of 72 guy. And the interesting thing is, is now if you all listen to Ben, you'll know that if you buy at this 88.6, the odds of you actually doubling your money on a move back to 72 in here are actually pretty darn good, like eight cents, seven and a half, eight cents. And there's 78.6 sitting at 16 cents. What a surprise. Can you see how that's almost exactly a double? Hmm. And that's thanks to Mr. Ben Koff Chet. So yeah, I'll tell you, that that's a trade level if I've ever seen one. Damn, stone cold. I don't know whether I want. See, the problem is, is I don't like encouraging bad behavior. So me coming in and buying dog money here is encouraging you know who to be a jerk. And frankly speaking, I think he did not do the public a lot of favors there. What is that? That's a and here's an interesting analogy. How long did we say bear markets typically last? And if you never heard this before, write it down. 
We change this to a, well, uh, let's go weekly, make it easier on you. What is a typical bear market? How long is it usually? Let's say a year and a half. So uh, if there's 52 weeks in a year, then that means there is one year right there. And another half a year is going to be 26. So that's going to be 70 six, maybe 77 bars, somewhere in there, 78. So can you see uh, what this thing, you know, uh, and actually what we should probably do is fib like this. What time is it? Oh, crap, Brian, you talk way too much. Now I screwed this up. Sorry, everybody. I have to go in uh, 27 minutes. I have no choice. I have to leave. Anyway, so you can see uh, probably, let's go call it in pump chaser zone. There we go. So you can actually see this thing could rally nicely all the way up there. Then um, actually probably what ends up happening is it actually does a lot quicker like that. So, and then you're off to a, a new bull market, right? And this of course is a nice head and shoulders, which paints uh, big fat price objectives for tests of old highs uh, over there. Yeah. So we're gonna zip up over there. And again, maybe this makes sense, you know, middle to the uh, latter part of next uh, year. I like the idea of the whole market coming alive. Remember we talked about Fed and how they, um, they uh, will be getting, anyway, we'll continue this conversation tomorrow. I got to get onto the questions, see if I can answer them very quickly. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. Hope you guys are getting some value out of all this. Brian sure loves the sound of his own voice, eh? Um, okay, so those are the charts. Yeah, this is the questions. So, okay. Number one, BB, how is your ZC Pippi spread trade doing now? I think it's back underwater. Uh, we were up there a couple uh, a couple bucks, but I think it's back underwater. So twenty nine thirty seven to the upside, thirty one eighty seven to the downside. So we're losing about two hundred and uh, what is that? About two hundred fifty bucks or so. Uh, One hundred, two hundred, yeah. But we're down about two hundred fifty bucks. So uh, spreads uh, it's doing its thing. When would you consider the spread trade complete and take profits? Well, definitely not when it's negative. That's for sure. Um, I don't, you know, that's a good question because really, it wasn't really like I wanted to do this trade and I was hunting it. I just threw it on here just so that you could visualize what the spread trade actually looks like, uh, especially on trading via kind of like paper trading uh, module. Um, but I, yeah, there it is. But I mean, from a technical analysis perspective, just quickly looking at this, kind of a, uh, um, this is uh, that uh, December uh, 22 and the July 23, the two charts. Um, we were making a bet that the uh, July contract would get more expensive relative to the near term contract. As, uh, as uh, we got closer and closer to the fall harvest, um, it, the, you know, I think our spread that we put on was right there. Uh, is this a good level to actually put this spread on? I don't think so. And there's the heaviest backwardization. I do like that kind of W, although that got stopped out. I do like this kind of W. I do like that kind of W. Putting it on right up here, Oof. I guess our, our idea was, um, and actually even, yeah, there's contango backwardization. So we put the spread on with the market already pretty heavily uh, contangoized, if you will. So is that actually a really good timed trade there on the spread? I don't think so. Uh, we were underwater, we were above water, uh, right? Because uh, here, well, we'll, just, we'll just put, um, right there. Uh, so underwater, above water, underwater. 
Uh, is this the kind of trade that I would even like, you know, as a commodities broker, hey, we got to go strap this spread on here? I don't think so. I mean, you're, you're coming really, really late to the party. Uh, this kind of signal, if you saw that little M top there, would it be a good idea maybe to strap on that spread and risk to a break of that range? Sure. You know, even all of these M's right here, you could have done all of these, right? And risked that market structure looking for the market to go down or conversely, right? Maybe you buy that spread breakout, which happens way over here, risking the bottom, looking for a move up. Okay. Uh, here? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a good trade whatsoever. Uh I would just simply call this uh, the I did this just to demonstrate what the spread's going to look like here. Um, I'm not even quite sure what the criteria is going to be for me to take it off. Obviously, I have to take it off before that December contract expires. And really, uh, I don't know I, if you're in the level two program, whoever asked this, but this is really all a question about the way future contract act as we're coming into expiry. And this idea that what we've done here is we're replacing price risk itself with what's called basis risk, which is nothing more than the spread between these two contracts. If the spread is natural and normal and healthy, it should be at a contango. So that's why, you know, strapping on the spread trade with it already being at such a massive contango. Ooh, that's not really a smart idea because really the odds are this thing's probably going to come back and check parity. And if there's any problem with the crop whatsoever, we might have to go back down into backwardization. So I don't, I'm not going to call this a timed trade whatsoever. And really, I hate to say it, but just even looking at this, I wouldn't have a problem, you know, like actual like traders got a trade kind of thing. If I was your commodities broker, and you called me up and said, Brian, I really like the idea of putting on the short spread where I'm going to uh, look for a move back um, to um, uh, backwardization or at least nothing more than this market is very optimistic, you know, judging by how far away it is from Contango. Market's really optimistic. Market's really frothy. I tried to short this uh, spread and it didn't work, but now I'm gonna I'm gonna take another shot and short this M. And you can see, like this one, for example, that's actually not a bad trade setup. You know, that spread right there, you're gonna risk to a break of the top and you're just gonna play that move down. Or buying this spread here, risk to a break of the W, playing that move up there. So Ironically enough, like we said, in our little example, we went long this spread here. I don't think that's a good trading decision whatsoever. Ironically enough, if I actually saw, like I was talking to a trader and you were like my customer, you're like, Brian, uh, strap on, I wanna go short this spread here. I'm going to uh, sell the deferred, con or buy the deferred contract, excuse me, buy the, uh, the July, and I'm going to sell the Decembers, that would be going short this spread and that would take advantage of this move. And that's that's probably quote unquote, the trade. So uh, don't look at this example like, uh, you know, Brian's writing a newsletter and this is a trade recommendation that he would be sending out to his newsletter to his clients. No, no, no. This was just nothing more than just demonstration. And if anything, let's just leave the trade on and come back to me in the middle of October, the middle of November. And let's just see what actually happened. Maybe this goddamn thing craps out and you remember our conversation about the little double top here and now we should have gone short this spread. And you go, you know, Brian, actually I really like the idea of the trade, but your trade that you put on there, you're right, that was a stupid shitty trade. <laughs> Way to go, you paper lost a fortune. <laughs> at least now you know what it, that looks like <laughs> so anyway i hope that answers that question okay got eight minutes to go oh, i kind of screwed this up today sorry everyone uh the pamp i currently use the term shares for debt to search for sec's edgar database what other terms can they use for this uh with regard to the americans i'm not sure um 
what I would suggest is do searches for shares for debt and just see what other vocabulary they use. Now, remember, I wrote all my licensing exams and all that kind of stuff when I had to know this stuff. Hell, I haven't even been a licensed stockbroker in what? Jeez, uh, almost like 15 years, <laughs> a long time. So um, I haven't kept up to date with exactly the terminology. And keep in mind that the Americans, they have a slight difference uh, with terms. Remember, I'm, I'm in Canada. So, you know, the Canadian regulators, they require shares for debt news dissemination. So it's pretty easy to search for that in Canada. In the States, I'm not exactly sure. You know, like, for instance, uh, we call it like rollback. We call it consolidation. We call it, uh, um, um, well, consolidation is the best term to use. In the States, they call a share rollback, a share consolidation, a reverse split. Now, why would you say that? That's like a double negative. <laughs> but it's just the way the Americans work. So to be perfectly honest with you, Pam, you know, through Monday, yeah, you know, we could even do this on the daily brief. We could do a little bit of a search tomorrow for you. But I honestly, I can't quote what the SEC says. And if anything, this might be a good example where you just literally go to the SEC and say, hey, I'm looking for companies that are issuing shares in their company in exchange for debt outstanding. What is the term that you use to describe that in your news releases? And that's probably the best su suggestion, Pam. And we just get the, the, the word from the horse's mouth. So if anything, uh, great that you just volunteered, that you are going to get in contact with the SEC and go about that process. And I can't wait to hear uh, your findings. Thank you so much for volunteering. I love that about you guys. Great job, Pam. Great job. Okay, number three, how would you suggest paying yourself out of a portfolio? Trading account in a situation where you live on the money you take from the market. Is there any good payout strategy? To be honest with you, I like to make sure that my full next year salary is paid for ahead of time. So I want to know that my entire income for two, like here we are, the middle of 2022. I want to know that my entire income for 2023 is already paid for. And I'm not even thinking about taking money out of my account. And especially like if you're going to play venture cap and stuff like that, when the market is face ripping up and you guys are all fucking Bitcoin, Bitcoin, and, you know, Danny's going fucking, fucking, and Luna guy's going, fuck you, United States of America. I, I'm in charge of the U.S. dollar now. That is your cue that you have to be getting ready for the next downturn. You have to be getting your money out of the market. Now, whether it be, look, I'm just going to take profits on these shit coins and park it in Bitcoin so then I can sell the Bitcoin fairly easily, fine. Whether it be I'm going to take my money entirely out of crypto and park it in a stable coin, well, good luck with stables. We all know that conversation of late. Are you going to take your money out and put it into an actual bank? Make sure that you're in a crypto-friendly jurisdiction. If you're not, then make damn sure you keep probably about a third of those profits uh, ready for the tax man. If anything, that's half the reason why we're contemplating moving to Portugal is we they still have a friendly Portugal tax, crypto tax policy. So uh, those are the kind of things that I would suggest you do. And frankly speaking, to play from a position of strength, I like to have a full year already bought and paid for if I'm actually going to, quote unquote, be a professional day trader. And I'm actually working on next year's profits now. So hope that helps. You probably don't like that answer, but that's that's the God's honest truth. And really what I would suggest to you, until you actually have that, keep your day job. Keep your part-time weekend job just so you absolutely know for certain your nut is covered. Once you got all that money in the bank, you know your nut is covered for the next year, then you can go and quit your jobs and fun things like that. 
Pam says, how much debt is acceptable for growth stocks? Um, frankly speaking, the less, the better. And the problem with debt is that nobody says boo about debt while we're in a falling interest rate environment. As soon as we switch into a rising interest rate environment, all hell breaks loose with regard to debt. So now you're going through the all hell breaks loose uh, because of debt window. You know, if you want to play this game where, okay, um, uh, <laughs> you like Danny quotes? <laughs> I don't know. Now that he's come out of the penalty box, I have a funny feeling he's going to have a little bit cleaner language. <laughs> <laughs> well, that guy is a character. And you know what's so funny, you guys? You're all the same. You're young. And so what's so funny is that you guys all act the same at the top of the market. You are all bulletproof. You are all superheroes. You are all going to change the world. You are all going to take over the world. And one day, boom, oh, reality sets in. <laughs> you mean BitConnect isn't for real? Damn. <laughs> Uh, anyway it's so cliche but the point is all of you guys should be able to see the writing on the walls that when people are acting like that especially with crypto now what have i told you guys you should all know this and if you don't write it down in your damn journals what is the one phrase that when you hear this one phrase you know the party's about to end now it might not end tonight it might take a month or two, might take six months, but as soon as you hear this phrase, you know the party's just about over. All right, you guys in the hangout got it. Excellent. Eddie, what do you think, Eddie? Have I made a material impact in your life? Do you think you're going to look at capitalism the same way uh, you looked at it before you knew me? If anything, that's a perfect uh, segue we'll leave on. Um, Less debt, the better. Now you can get away with carrying debt if we're ahead of that Jupiter-Saturn cross. And you all know Jupiter-Saturn cross, that's the key. So the good part about it is we don't have another Jupiter-Saturn cross for another 20 freaking years. But I can tell you what will end up happening is when we get to the Jupiter-Saturn opposition, that's when the next pivot will be. So as we're heading into those events, the debt situation won't be that critical. But once we go through that, then any debt that you have, you are at, you're, you're, you literally are playing with fire and you might not make it through the cycle. So if we're investing our hard-earned money in companies, publicly traded companies, the best thing that we can have happen is you don't want to see any debt, no debt. And, you know, like the VCIM model, ideally what I want to see is I want to see companies that were in debt, but actually rolled their stock back, issued new shares in exchange for that debt, meaning they don't have any debt now. And the people that were indebted to them actually are now shareholders of the company. You can't have a better situation than that. Okay, so 12.30, Brian's got a toodle. I've got about a good 45-minute commute to get to the boy. So uh, all of you, please wish me luck with the boy. Uh, we'll continue on these, uh, these questions uh, tomorrow uh, in the uh, daily brief. Uh, um, um, what the hell's your name, Chris? <laughs> If you could remind me <laughs> uh, to pick up where we left off, question five. <laughs> I hope you guys got some good value uh, out of the broadcast today. Let us know in the comments field whether you like the new format. Do you like seeing the old man on camera? Does it make that much of a difference to you guys? Do you give a rat's ass either way? Remember, I really got to stress this. I don't want to have to fucking drive 45 minutes to get to Liam. I got to be able to do things like, you know, it sucks. I never wanted to do this, but I think what I have to do is uh, things like monetize the YouTube channel so that uh, we can help uh, boost the viewership 
get more people in the school program, get more of you, you know, show you the value in actually becoming site members. Um, and, uh, and, you know, let, let, let's all make it a goal together that we're going to buy Liam a pretty sweet pad. And the good part about it is the Vancouver real estate market is finally broken. So now it's just a question of waiting for the actual shit to hit the fan. And once it does, and all these people start going through bankruptcies and stuff, then we should be able to get Liam a place uh, on a half decent price. I'm not spending $2 million on a home for my son. That's ridiculous. But I will spend a half a million. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, everybody, have yourselves a fantastic rest of your day. I'd love to see TRI go mainstream. I'd love to see tons and tons and tons of views of this free content where I really try and help all of you. So it should be a win-win both ways, but I do need for you guys to hit the like button, subscribe, ring the bell, make YouTube nice and happy, uh, and you know, leave comments, please, that you like the offering, you saw value, and uh, that uh, actually you consider that Beamish guy pretty handsome and you'd like to see him more on camera. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have yourself a great day. PMA for the win. All the best. And bye for now.